All right. All right. Um, welcome, Comp 1 online class. Uh, what I want us to do today is discuss trifles. And just a, a quick heads up, I'm going to sort of teach it um, the way I would teach uh, you know, teach this as a as a, as a lit text. Uh, this is a, a play that's in the American Lit Text book, and I, uh, I use it for Comp 1 as um, part of arguing. And so um, what I want you to do is, if it's feasible to have a copy of the play, all 13 pages in front of you, I think it's a good idea to get that because I'm going to be um, quoting to and referring to it, um, you know, through, throughout this lecture. And also, if you do have it, I want you to take the se uh, a second to number each page one, two, three, all the way to page thirteen. Uh, it, it'll it'll make it easier for when I refer to certain pages, and then it'll also come in handy when um, quoting for your essay. So um, th that's that's something to do. And so if you haven't done that, if you want to pause the video really fast and do that, uh, it, again it'll just make this um, go smoother for you. So. All right. What I wanted to do is just kind of give um, just sort of a brief, close reading analysis um, of the text, and then kind of give you a little bit of of, of uh, you know background in terms of discussion and how to think about the play. And then what I'll do is next week um, post a video where we look at maybe the strengths and the weaknesses, look at both sides of the uh, of many rights guilt. You know, looking at it as hey, maybe she's either innocent or she shouldn't be punished that harshly or that she is guilty and she needs to be punished harshly. So we'll look at um, the argumentative aspect of it uh, in another video. All right. So um, if you have your um, play in front of you, go ahead and turn to page six. And I just want to look at a couple of things here. Now, I will say this. Um, you know, this lecture is, is intended to uh, supplement reading the play for yourself. If you just don't read the play and then you just kind of go off of what I say here and then what I say in the next video it's going to be obvious because trust me I've taught this play enough that when students try to write about it and they haven't read it um, it shows uh, so just a, just a quick heads up all right um, go about three-fourths of the way down the page on, um, on page six now uh, an interesting story that happened here in Tennessee uh, actually earlier this week um, a woman in Giles County was um, arrested for the murder of her husband, and um, she murdered her husband back in 1990, right? You know, before a lot of y'all were born, and is is kind of an interesting thing that you know they did an investigation. They, they thought she was the primary suspect, but they didn't really have anything to pin it on her. And the reason why they were able to arrest her now is because she sold the house that she and her husband lived in. The the new owners found blood on the floor. I don't know if they pulled up floors trying to build, you know, put in new floors or what. But that evidence caused them to reopen the case. They dug up his body, and then because of DNA evidence, um, they were able to find uh, enough to to um, at least arrest her. Now, uh, it's interesting because this all happened in 1990, the original crime, and now it's 2016, and we're just now really having the technology to you know find it. Um, this play was originally published in the early 20th century, so you can see how. Um, far back the, um, the the crime solving methods were. So the fact that um, Mrs. Peters and Mrs. Hale are in the house and just kind of going through stuff, uh, it, it seems crazy now. I mean, in, in 2016, but back then it wouldn't have been such a, a, a big deal. Um, even probably as late as 1990 in, in a very rural place like um, where this, I mean, we don't get a specific place where this take, you know, where this happens, but you can see in maybe a very rural area how this um, type of behavior in a, in a crime scene would have been okay because you know it was pre-CSI and things like that. So anyway, enough introduction. Mrs. Hale uh, says, well, that's just what Mr. Hale said. There was a gun in the house. He says that's what he can't understand. Mr. He Mr. Henderson said coming out that what was needed for the case was a motive something to show anger or sudden feeling. All right, let's stop there for a minute. Uh, if you want someone dead and there's a gun in the house and they're asleep, you shoot them with the gun, right? That's not what happened here, right? 
Mr. Hell, someone tied a rope around his neck when he was asleep and then essentially hanged him or choked him to death. Now, obviously, the main suspect is Minnie Wright, but if she wanted him dead, why not just shoot him? And so this is kind of the, the, the sort of the first uh, bit of mystery within the play. Like, uh, it kind of sheds a little bit of doubt on the case and, and, and a little bit of confusion as well. Um, bottom of page six. Wonder how they're finding things upstairs. I hope she had it a little more red up there. Uh, you know, it seems kind of sneaking, locking her up in town and then coming out here and trying to get her own house to turn against her. But Mrs. Hell, the law is the law. I'm going to stop there for a minute. If you want to quote that, that's fine. But a lot of times students in their essays, they will use that phrase, the law is the law, in their paper. And it's a bit of a cliche when it comes to this assignment. So I would avoid saying that phrase. If, I mean, if you want to quote Mrs. Peters here, that's fine. And then discuss the significance of that quote. You know, that, that's different. But I wouldn't use that as part of your thesis or, or anything like that. Skip down a little bit. Um, skip down a couple lines. Um, it's log cabin pattern. Uh, pretty, isn't it? I wonder if she was going to quilt it or not it. The sheriff comes in. He overhears this last part. <laughs> they wonder if she was going to quilt it or just not it. And then if you look at the stage directions, it says the men laugh, the women look abashed or embarrassed. All right. Um, go to page eight and go about uh, three fourths of the way down the page where Mrs. Peter says, why look at this door? Now, um, just keep your finger there for a second. Um, the whole, when, when the sheriff says that if they're going to quilt it or not it, um, he's joking, but he's, he's kind of talking down to them. I think one of the reasons why Glaspell makes this play is to show that the trifles or the little things in life um, can also be big things. And, you know, you, you have the sheriff and you have Mr. Henderson, the DA, the district attorney, they're looking for evidence. And the women are here just sort of in the kitchen as an afterthought. And I think what Glaspell, the author, is trying to say is that some of those things that we consider afterthoughts um, are actually important, you know, especially to the people who are in charge of those afterthoughts. Like when I was in high school, I had a basketball coach who uh, he had a poster in his office that said, do the little things as if they were big things. OK. And I think the thing uh, here in the play is that by sometimes paying attention to the little things, you actually solve uh, the big things. And so, yeah, Mr. Uh, you know, the sheriff, Mr. Hill, doesn't mean anything by it. Uh, neither does uh, Mr. Henderson when they are kind of making fun of the women uh, and, and what they're talking about or talking down to them. Uh, but if you are one of the women in the play or in this society, you can see how this is an issue. OK, let's keep going. Well, look at this door. It's broke. Uh, one hinge is pulled apart. Looks as if someone must have been rough with it. Why, yes. She brings the cage forward and puts it on the table. God, I wish they're going to find any evidence they'd be about it. I don't like this place. All right, let's look at the, uh, we're at the top of page nine. Let's stop there for a minute. I don't like this place. Right? Um, you know, and we, we kind of get a little bit more information in the next two pages why someone would say that. I mean, we've all been in rooms or houses or buildings where it's just a little creepy. It's just a, it's a, it's a little weird, and you can't necessarily say why that's the case, but you know this something's not right here. And you can see that you see the broken cage, and you're just like, ugh. Uh, uh, this is one more thing in a whole list of things that just doesn't seem right. Okay, listen to what Mrs. Peter says. I'm awful glad you came with me, Mrs. Hale. It would be lonesome for me sitting uh, here alone. And I think it'd be more than just lonesome. It would, wouldn't it? Uh, but I tell you what I do wish, Mrs. Peters. I wish I had come over sometimes when she was here, or when she was here. I, I wish I had. But of course, uh, you were awful busy, Mrs. Hale. Uh, your house and, and, and your children, I should have come. I, I stayed away because it weren't cheerful. and. That's why I ought to. I, I should have come. I, I never liked this place. Maybe it's because it's down in a hollow and you don't see the road. I don't know what it is, but it's a lonesome place and always was. I I wish I'd come over here to see Minnie Foster sometimes. I can see now. Well, you mustn't reproach yourself, Mrs. Hale. Somehow, 
we just don't see how it is with other folks until something comes up. All right, stop there for a minute. There's a lot going on in, in, in those lines. All right. It is lonesome um, in certain places for different reasons. Uh, oftentimes it's it's the location. Like if you look, um, it says maybe because it was down in a hollow and you don't see the road. So this house wasn't on a, you know, it wasn't on a street where you can see the road from the street. It was almost tucked away, hidden. You had to, you know, we've all been on long driveways where you kind of, where the driveway sort of snakes around and then you see the house. So the house is a little isolated. All right. So that kind of gives it a creepy feeling. And then the more we read, we see that John Wright um, also gave it a, a, a little bit of a creepy feeling. And, and I and I know how this feels like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking to buy a house right now. And I, uh, I was in this house in Murfreesboro and me and the realtor, we were both looking at each other like this house is weird. There's something about this. And he was like, yeah, it almost seems like it'd be haunted. And we kind of looked around in all the rooms and I was like, man, I kind of want to leave. He's like, yeah, man, this is a weird feeling. You know, and we have no idea what was going on in the house. There were no people there, but there was just something about the way things were put together that it just didn't quite seem right. And I feel like many Wright's houses and, and John Wright's house was a little bit like that. But when Mrs. Hale says, I should have come, I should have visited. And Mrs. Peters is like, well, you were busy. Mrs. Hale's like, no, that's no excuse. I should have visited. And I think this is important. Like we're all busy, right? We all have jobs and friends and family and, and 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 responsibilities and you know, but we still have to make time for things. And when when Mrs. Peters says sometimes somehow we just don't see how it is with other folks until something comes up, it's very true. I mean, you know, we all have that friend that we haven't talked to in a while, and uh, you know, uh, that family member we probably should give a call or a text to, and we don't. And then something happens and we're like, man, I should have taken the time to do that. Right. We're always really busy and and things are always hectic in the moment. And then when something happens and we look back in hindsight, you know, things weren't as busy as we thought. We, we, we could have taken the time to to do, you know, X, Y and Z, you know. And so something to think about there. Uh, not necessarily having to do with the paper per se, but Glaspell, the author, providing a lot of life lessons here in this play. All right. Somehow we just don't see how, how it is with folks until something comes up. You know, not having children makes less work, but it makes a quiet house. And right out to work all day, no company when he did come in. Did you know John Wright, Mrs. Peters? No, I mean, I've Seen him in town. They say he was a good man. Yes, good. I mean, he didn't drink and kept his word as well as most, I guess, and paid his debts. But he was a hard man, Mrs. Peters. Just to pass the time of day with him, <sighs> like a raw wind that gets to the bone. I should think she would have wanted a bird. But, but what do you suppose went with it? I'll stop there. Um, this is something we've kind of talked a little bit about uh, this semester um, with uh, with the, some of the things we read, like like the definitions of things. Like, what does it mean to be a good man? You know, I mean, we've looked at what does it mean to make a good advertisement. Uh, what do, what does it mean to make a um, a good argument? Um, you know, what does it mean to be, like, if you think of the Stephen King article, mentally ill, or the Alexa Hackbarth article, what does it mean to be a metrosexual, right? Um, here we get, what does it mean to be a good man? And Mrs. Hale says, you know, I, I guess he was good. I mean, he paid his debts, kept his word, didn't drink. Um, by some definition that you could argue that that's a good man. But there are other things that go into defining who someone is. You know, and Mrs. Hale's like, but to pass the time of day with him, oh, you know, and, and I think this is a very interesting thing because the way men define things, at least in certain cases, is different than the way women define, them. you know, hey, you know, John Wright, hey, good guy, you know, I, I did some business with him, he was honest, kept his word, made all his payments on time, you know, but maybe a woman views it differently, a woman may say, hey, what would it like? What would it be like to spend a day or an afternoon with with John Wright? You know, if you look at it, if you define it in that way, 
maybe he's not such a good man. Maybe he's not an evil man, but maybe he's not a, a good man either. So it's, it's an interesting thing. I think Glassbell is, is the author is playing with, you know, how we define people. How, how do, you know, what do we mean when we say, oh, that's a good guy or, oh, that's a good friend. You know, uh, what we think we mean may, may mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Let's keep going. Bottom of page nine. She, come to think of it, you know, she was kind of like a bird herself. Real sweet and pretty, but kind of timid and fluttery. How she did change. Tell you what, Mrs. Peters, why don't you take the quilt in with you? It, it might take up her mind. Okay, stop there for a minute. Um... This happens, you know, when you're uh, in a relationship or you're not the same person. I mean, you, you, you change a little bit, but listen to how ch drastically she changes. Real sweet and pretty, maybe kind of timid and fluttery. And then how she did change, like glass bill using those dashes to show that it, you know, that, that it wasn't just, oh, she changed a little. No, it was a drastic change. And. This kind of gives you this sense that this relationship, you know, between Minnie and John Wright, it wasn't just a a marriage that, you know, had its ups and downs. It seems like there was maybe something a little bit more um, at play here. Let's keep going. Well, I think it's a real nice idea, Mrs. Hale. Uh, there couldn't possibly be any objection to it, could there? Now, just what would take? What, now, just what would, what would I take? I, I wonder if her patches are in here and her things. Um, let's skip the next couple of lines. Mrs. Peters, it's it's the bird. But Mrs. Peters, look at its neck. It's look at its neck. It's all to the other side. Somebody wrung its neck. Now Glaspell's doing a lot of things here in these in these few lines. Um, we get the um, comparison of Mrs. Peters. I'm sorry, of, of Minnie Wright um, to a bird, right? She's timid and fluttery. And then a couple lines later, we find a dead bird with its neck wrung, all right? And so what we're seeing here is, um, you know, Glasspool wants us to make a connection between Minnie Wright and the bird. And now this isn't the only connection that Glasspool is going to have us make. I mean, later in the play, we'll get another connection between the bird. But... We're supposed to look at Gla um, Minnie Wright and the bird as sort of um, sit, you know, uh, in the same light. Like one of the phrases, I don't know if we still use it, but uh, you know, I, I hear a lot is spirit animal. So and so is my spirit animal. Well, here this bird is is kind of like her spirit animal, right? And then if you look at the stage directions here, we see something very interesting happen. Their eyes meet, a look of growing comprehension, of horror. Right. See what just happened there? I mean, they're talking bes between themselves. I mean, we've all done it, right? Whether you're playing sports and you make eye contact with a teammate and he, you know, you know what he's going to do. Um, or, or, you know, you, um, you're you hanging out with your friends and some annoying person comes and sits next to you and then you and your friends just look and make eye contact. I mean, we all do it, on, you know, on some level. Um, that's what's happening here. They make eye contact with each other and they're thinking, you know, almost like this uh the signal goes between their minds and, and then they put the dots together you know john wright was killed the way that he was killed because of the way the bird was killed right i mean this is this is kind of obvious and they they put this together what should they do at this point they should probably say hey sheriff mr henderson i think we found the evidence the sudden feeling that you were looking for Mrs. Hale, but that, they don't do that, though. Mrs. Hale slips box under quilt pieces and sinks into her chair. Enter sheriff and county attorney. Uh, Mrs. Peter rises. Well, ladies, have you decided whether she was going to quilt it or not it? We think she was going to not it. All right. Now, this is interesting. They're kind of, you know, talking down. I mean, they're, again, they're not, they don't mean to, but... You know, it's like, hey, we're talking about important things, but all the women are here. We'll just talk just to be nice to them. But meanwhile, they've cracked the case. Now, maybe we'll see a little bit more a little bit later why they don't um, say anything immediately. But 
the whole not it, if you look at the your version of the play, not it is underlined. And if you think about, I think it's a little bit of a pun on, or, or play on not it. Like if you're a kid and you're playing tag and everyone says not it and the last one to say it is, is it. Um, I think there's a little bit of that going on, like not it, like I'm like, you know, we're not going to um, give her over just yet. She's not it talking about Minnie Wright. County attorney. Well, that's interesting. I'm sure he sees the birdcage. Has the bird flown? Uh, we think the cat got it. Is there a cat? Well, not now. They're superstitious. You know, they leave. So we we'll turn to page 11. You see them, you know, sticking up for Minnie Wright. Um, you know, instead of just saying, hey, look, we found this evidence. This is what you need. Uh, and and and. You know, we'll talk a little bit about this, and this is something you may even want to talk about in your paper, but they, they hide the evidence. Um, this kind of maybe, I mean, they didn't help commit the crime, but could you argue that they are sort of accessories, at least to a certain degree? I mean, it's not, you know, it's not illegal to lie to the police, but it is illegal to hide evidence. So, all right, top of page 11. She liked the bird. She was going to bury it in that pretty box. When I was a girl, my kitten, there was a boy that took a hatchet in before my eyes and before I could get there, if they hadn't held me back, I would have hurt him. All right, stop there. Mrs. Peters has what we call a commonplace, um, something in common with someone else like, and it's, it's good to be able to ha have these common places it's, it's what it's why we're able to have friends and, and, and things like that like we have something in common and mrs peters is able to she's like i know what it's like to have my pet killed by someone else and not like in a merciful or humane way like when i was a girl a boy took a hatchet to my cat to my kitten if they hadn't helped me back i would have hurt them and that's very, and you could see her being like, I'm identifying with Minnie Wright on some level here. Um, let's keep going. We get in, by the end of this um, page, by the bottom of this page, we get the connection between the bird and something else, not just Minnie Wright. I wonder how it would seem never to have had any children around. No, Wright wouldn't like a bird that sang. She used to sing. He killed that too. We don't know who killed the bird. I knew John Wright. It was an awful thing that was done in the house that night, Mrs. Hale. Killing a man while he slept, slipping a rope around his neck that choked the life out of him. His neck. Choked the life out of him. You know, we don't know who killed him. We don't know. Stop there for a minute. Um, Mrs. Peters is saying, we don't know. We don't know who killed them. Um, even earlier, she goes, we don't know who killed the bird. And Mrs. Hale's like, I knew John Wright. And and this is actually um, pretty interesting. And I sometimes hit on this a little bit more in my American Lit classes than I do in my composition classes. But uh, I think it's important that were they there? Do they know who killed the bird and, and what happened? And do we know who killed you know, were they there? They don't know. They weren't there, but they knew John Wright. They can look around and have enough information to where they can fill in the gaps. And and that's what education is about. You know, your whole life, you're going to be asked to make decisions based on incomplete information. And what education does is basically good education is, listen, we can't help you fill in all the gaps. But when you are confronted with a situation where, you, where there's gaps in information, you can still make the best decision possible based on the information you do have. And that's what's happening here. You know, they weren't there, but they know John Wright. They see the bird. They see the bird cage. And they can start putting things together. Okay? And, and, and that's what's happening here. So when somebody says something like, oh, well, you weren't there, so you don't know. Well, you don't you don't always have to be there to know what happened. Right. If you have enough information, enough contextual information, you know, you can fill in the gaps between what you know, what you don't know. All right. 
If there had been years and years of nothing, then a bird to sing to you, it would be awful still after the bird was still. I know what stillness is. When we homesteaded in Dakota and my first baby died after he was two years old and me with no other than, hey, how soon do you suppose they'll be through looking for the evidence? I know what stillness is. Stop there. I really like this part here because Mrs. Peters has another commonplace. Right? Mrs. Peters then associates the dead bird with her dead child. Right? That feeling of, because there were no children, right? John and Minnie Wright were childless. So this bird sort of like Minnie Wright's child, you know, and it's one thing to have, you know, to be like, oh, this is my fur baby. But in the future, you know, OK, uh, I'm going to have children or, or at least plan on it. But Minnie Wright, she's not having children. If she would have had children, she would have had them by now. So this is it for her. And so there may be a little bit more attachment to the bird than, than you know, than, than maybe most people would have. And so Mrs. Peters is like, I know, I know that feeling. At the top of the page, she knows what it's like to have a dead pet. And at the bottom of the page, she knows what it's like to have a dead child. And so I think Glaspell, the author, is definitely trying to get us to make this connection that this bird wasn't just a pet. It wasn't just uh, this cute animal that she had around the house, but it was like her child. It represented maybe part of who she was. Okay. And I do like Mrs. Hale gets uncomfortable. She's like, hey, how soon do you suppose they'll be looking, uh, be through looking for the evidence? She tries to change the subject. And Mrs. Peters is like, no, I know what stillness is. Okay. And, and this is good because sometimes, you know, we need to have serious, uncomfortable conversations. And sometimes people will try to get out of it by changing the subject or joking around. And Mrs. P Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Peters is like, no, I'm talking about stillness. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about what it's like to have someone you love dead, you know. And Mrs. Hill's like sitting there trying to, you know, talk about all this other stuff. And Mrs. Peters does a letter. Again, this is Glassbull doing a lot of things here in the play, not just telling a story, but um, almost, you know, really teaching us some things. And then Mrs. Hill, let's look at this. This is what she has to say. I wish you'd seen Minnie Foster when she wore a white dress with blue ribbons and stood up there in the choir and sang. Oh, I wish I'd come over here once in a while. That was a crime. That was a crime. Who's going to punish that? Go to the top of page 12. Again, making that connection between, she's made the connection, Glasspool's made the connection between the bird and Minnie Wright's children, or at least non-children, and then making the connection between Minnie Wright and the bird again. Top of page 12. God, I might have known she needed help. I know how things can be for women. I tell you, it's queer, Mrs. Peters. We live close together and we live far apart. We all go through the same things. It's it's just a different kind of same thing. I'll just stop there. Um, I like this line here, you know. I know how things can be for women. I tell you, it's queer, Mrs. Peters. I live We live close together when we live far apart. Um, and then the whole thing about the same things is just a different kind of same thing. Now, she's talking about women, obviously, but can't this apply to a lot of things? I mean, we all go through the same things in life. In life, It's just a different type of same things. Um, let me, if I were to ask you, and I'm, I'm sure all of y'all are looking at this video at different times and different places, and but you, you know, you all have, you know, different backgrounds. I mean, there's some similarities, but there are some differences, you know. Um, but you know, I mean, if I said, how many of y'all like to eat? All of y'all would raise your hand. Most, you know, 98% of y'all. Right? If I asked you, what was your favorite food? I'd probably get different answers. You know, y'all, it's all the same thing, but just different types of same things. You know, one of my favorite shows is, um, it comes on Food Network. It's called Chopped. And, you know, all the chefs that they, they come on the show, they're from different backgrounds, different parts of the country, even different parts of the world. And they all say the same things. In my culture, in my family, food and, 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 and fellowship are, are important to us. Right? It doesn't matter where they're from. Now, that, that food looks different. 
the way they fellowship, the music they like, the way they dance, uh, the way they joke around may be different, but they all like sort of the same, the same types of things. All right. And then tying it back here to, um, to the play with Mrs. Hill. Um, I know how things can be for women. We all go through the same things, but different types of same things. Yeah, I think it's the idea that, hey, Mrs. Hill may be, be like, look, it's it's not my marriage isn't like many rights marriage was, but I understand some of the things that she may have went through, maybe not being isolated and maybe even be, you know being unhappy or, or or childless, but there's still some of the same things that I, I can still make enough of a commonplace with her and some of her struggles. I can look around at her house and see the knitting and the um, you know the, the the fruit that's been left out, and be like, I, I know what she's, what, at least on some level, some of the things that she goes through. Some of the, the and I think it's true for for y'all, right? I mean, y'all are college students. Um, some of y'all are dual enrollment students. I mean, college students at every school, from Motlow to UT Martin, UT Knoxville, and Vanderbilt and MTSU, college students, regardless, kind of go through the same things. It's a different type of same thing, right? Whether you're an English major or a psychology major or a chemistry major, major, so, but it's it's, it's it's different things. Your homework looks different, but it's it's this it's a lot of the same things. So I, I think the reason why I'm harping on this so much is because I think it's important for us to kind of keep these things in mind. And um, sometimes people see the world differently from, than us, but um, they may come from a lot of they, they they come from some of the same sort of situations and maybe if we were from their situation um, we would see the things that they see and, and, and see things the way they do anyway um, let, let's keep moving mrs. Peters uh, my it's, it's a good thing the men couldn't hear us when they just laugh getting all stirred up over a little thing like <laughs> like a dead canary as if that could have anything to do with it. when they laugh Maybe they would. Maybe they wouldn't. The county attorney comes back in. No, Peters, it's all perfectly clear except a reason for doing it. But you know juries when it comes to women. If there was some definite thing, something to show, something to make a story about, a thing that would connect up with the strange way of doing it. Let me stop there. And this is true. And, you know, men as on a whole, I mean, we commit crimes more than women. Um, so if this were reversed, if many right had been killed and John Wright were the one in custody, um, it would probably take a lot less to convict him than, than it would her. Um, and maybe that's changing a little bit. I mean, we got shows like Snapped about women who snap and kill their husbands. Um, you know, so maybe it's changing a little bit. But I, I think that's still generally true today that um, a woman um, suspected of a crime, it probably takes a little bit more um, in terms of evidence to convince a jury because generally speaking um, women don't commit crime as often as men uh, especially I think if we're talking about many rights case especially in this way like she tied a rope around his neck and then choked him to death I mean that is a very elaborate and I imagine um, takes a lot of strength um, you know type of crime so you can see how or a lot of physical strength so you can see how that can be a, a little bit of an issue there but um, and so and again, this is why the dead bird is so um, so crucial because when you see that dead bird, it's easy to make that connection between the death. So let's go about three fourths of the way down, um, page twelve, almost finished. Uh, do, do you need to look at the? Do you want to see what Mrs. Peters is going to take in? Uh, I guess they're not very dangerous things the ladies have picked. No, Mrs. Peters doesn't need supervising. For that matter, a sheriff's wife is married to the law. Ever think of it that way, Mrs. Peters? Well, not just that way. <laughs> married to the law. All right, let's stop there for a minute. Uh, I like that Mrs. Peters is just like, well, you know, it's it's not just that way. You know, and this, this idea that, hey, look, you know, I have an identity outside of my husband. Uh, th this kind of happened this year in the Olympics that, uh, uh, you know, where you know there'd be a news story like wife of Chicago Bears player wins gold medal, and you know there was a little bit of uproar. You know I don't think the newspaper editors and writers meant to be, you know, uh, uh, you know offensive to certain people, but the the idea was wait a minute this 
woman who won a gold medal, she has an identity outside of her husband. You know, you can use her actual name. Um, she's not just the wife of some football player. She's her own person with her own career. You know what I'm saying? And so I think it was a, a, a skier. And and to um you know to to my credit, um, I can't remember his name, the player, the football player's name, or the skier's name. So I guess I'm uh, equally um, uh, you know offensive there. But um, but but that the idea was just that. Hey, wait. You know, she's not just the wife of someone. She's a person apart from her husband. And then here with Mrs. Peters saying, yeah, Mrs. Hale is married to a sheriff, but she's not married to the law. And even if she were, her decisions are independent, may, you know, maybe independent of, of of just who her husband is. I mean, uh, you know, part of who you are, at least on some level, is your, your spouse. But it's not just that's not all you are. So I think there's a little bit of that going on top of page 13 let's look at the stage directions here because uh, oftentimes in plays we, we like to focus on the dialogue but especially in plays that are more modern when I say modern I mean late 19th century to now you know stage directions are important let's look at it Hale goes outside the sheriff follows the county attorney in the other room then Mrs. Hale rises hands tight together looking intensely at Mrs. Peters whose eyes make a slow turn finally meeting Mrs. Hale's. So they talk with their eyes again. A moment, Mrs. Hale holds her, then her own eyes point the way to where the box is concealed. Suddenly, Mrs. Peters throws back quilt pieces and tries to put the box in the bag she's wearing. It is too big. She opens the box, starts to take bird out, cannot touch it, goes to pieces, stands there helpless. Sound of a knob turning in the other room. Mrs. Hale snatches the box and puts it in the pocket of her big coat. Enter the county attorney and sheriff. All right. So there's a lot going on there, just reading it. Um, but what happens is they have this moment where they're like, okay, are we going to hide the, the evidence or are we going to turn her in? And neither one of them can, can quite do it alone. And they're, they're making eye contact. They're looking like, are you going to do it? I, I don't want to do it. And at the last minute, they decide to do it. And you can kind of see where... Um, the second to last line of the stage direction, there's a sound of a knob turning. So you can see if you're watching this play on stage and uh, the, the women are deciding, OK, what, what are we going to do? Or, are we, and then there's a knob, you know, there's a door getting ready to open. So you, they better hurry up and decide. And the county attorney comes in. And if you look at the stage direction, he asked this facetiously. Um, facetiously means it can mean sarcastic or in a joking way or in a condescending way where you're talking down to someone as you know when you talk down to someone you're talking to them as if they're not as smart as you you know well henry at least we found out that she was not going to quilt it uh she was going to uh what do you call it ladies uh we call it not it mr henderson i mean the, the play ends and uh now, anyway, the you, you get a lot of interesting stuff, um, you know, happening there, and I like that at least in the, you know, that that final scene, there's there's a little conflict b between the women, like what should we do? Should we do this? I mean, because I mean, this is they're helping conceal a crime, and we don't get what happens the next day or anything, but the um, the dead bird is actually going to Minnie Wright, so they remember they're getting things for her to take to, to her jail cell because she is in custody because she is a suspect and you can see if you're Minnie Wright you're in the jail cell you open up you see that dead bird and you can continue with, with whatever you were going to do in terms of burying him or um, you know giving a, giving him a home um, one of the things we do know is that Mr. Wright I'm sorry um, Mr. Hale and Mr. Henderson don't get the dead bird and so what I want us to do is um, next week I'm going to try to do it early next week do a video where we look at both sides where if you are a prosecutor wanting to convict Minnie Wright, we can look at the evidence in the play or look at the you know what's being discussed in the play and say, hey, there's enough evidence to convict her. Or if you would want to be the defense for Minnie Wright and say, hey, wait, there's not enough evidence to convict her. And even if we do have enough evidence, there's enough to where we could say she shouldn't be convicted. So um, we'll look at both sides just like we did with the articles and then um, sort of go from there. So, all right, y'all, uh, I'm not sure when you're going to be watching this, but have a good weekend, and I will um, talk with y'all soon. If I can figure out how to.